call the meeting to order, and uh, we'll note that all three commissioners are present in the courtroom, and if the commissioners will identify themselves, Todd Hyatt is present. Bob Anthony, present. Dana Murphy, present. So there is a quorum present. Uh, notice is appropriate. I want to remind everyone to please uh, mute your phones and devices as we go through the meeting. And Ms. Mitchell, Commission Secretary, are you on the line? Could you please present today's agenda? Yes, Commissioners, good morning. On the agenda for Thursday, February 25th, 2021, submitted for your vote are the following proposed orders. There are 23 CDs, which includes one companion cause. I do need to let you know that the companion cause was attached to the wrong uh, cause number on the agenda. Um, if you'll notice on CD 2020-1915, it has a companion cause of 2019-5341. However, that 29-5341 should be attached to CD 2019-5098. It's been corrected in the computer. Um, however, um, the agenda was posted before the correction was needed so, or noticed. So we also have three enforcements on the 24-hour agenda. We have five PUDs. We have PUD 2020-74, a final order. PUD 2020-96, an order granting motion to amend procedural schedule and extend remaining dates by four weeks. PUD 2020-102, final order designating Easy Telephone Services Company, DBA Easy Wireless as an eligible telecommunications carrier in additional areas. PUD 2020-107, final order granting withdrawal of certificates of convenience and necessity and cancellation of tariffs. And PUD 2021-34, order granting motion for protective order. Questions or comments on the daily agenda? Commissioner Murphy. Um, I note that we have a matter before us that is unusual, um, but I'm, I'm planning to support it today. It's 2020-2153, and it's an application by Petrolera. Um, I think it would have been better that it did not come in front of us on an emergency basis, but I understand that it mentioned that leases would be expiring. I don't see any indication in the order of the financial loss that would occur, and I think typically on emergencies, um, there's an indication of financial loss. It says suffer loss, but we don't really know what the financial loss is. But I think I feel more assured because it's my understanding there's a $25,000 cashier's bond. I do think it could be helpful if the company could get the well to um, producing, so I'm inclined to support it. Please mute your devices. I'm inclined to support it, but I would have concerns if we had a lot of these that came before us with, without thinking it through a little bit more, but I, I give credit to the company for trying to um, do something with an orphan well, and I just wanted to make mention of that. Thank you. I will support it also. Other questions on the daily agenda? Seeing none, Peggy, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. We'll Thank move you. to the 24 hour agenda, and, and uh, with no objection from my colleagues, I'll We'll dispense with presentations unless there are specific questions. Um, I do have questions on the first matter, 2020-74 Fort Cobb Fuel Authority. And Ms. Willingham, are you available? Yes, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. I had just a couple of um, a couple of fundamental questions, and then I did want to ask about um, one of the recommendations of the Public Utility Division that appeared to be supported by the Attorney General as well. So I'll get to that question in just a moment. But generally, where are these 3,000 or so customers of Fort Cobb located? 
Uh, I believe that that is the northwestern part of the state. I, I hope I'm correct on that. I didn't double check the map, I'll be honest, but I think it's in the northwestern part of the state. Okay, then that, that's fine. Um, and I'll just go ahead and then go to my, my fundamental question. Okay, it says that the public utility recommends that Fort Cobb should create a substantive written company policy to become effective in 2021, which outlines the processes and methodology used for making decisions regarding gas procurement. So can you give us some background on that? And what what is really being requested? What's a substantive written company policy? And then if you could relate that to the other uh, natural gas utilities, have something like that, or can you give us more information? Yes, Commissioner. Um, so I think for the past uh, couple of PGA clause reviews, there have just been some issues in efficiencies in the audit. There's been new personnel, and it's been kind of hard to pin down during the um, prudence review what the exact policies of the company are. And PUD just felt that for the benefit of the company, the customers, PUD, in doing our review for efficiency, that it might be time to just go ahead and lay out the policy and the company saw the value in that. I believe the attorney general saw the value in that as well. Um, so that they'll have this document moving forward. It'll help PUD and its audit moving forward, but it'll also help the company that way when they have personnel in their procurement area leave and, and new personnel come in, they'll have a document that they can refer to. I don't believe every utility has this specific document, but PUD always encourages that companies develop that and with this specific company, it, it just came up during the audit and everyone agreed that it was a good idea and we decided to move forward. Okay, so it would be your understanding that the company knows generally what the public utility division is looking for. So it's not come up with a document that we approve of. It's like here's some parameters you need to, to um, have as part of a policy and, and you need to create one. Is, that, is it more is that the latter the case? It, it is. There are ongoing discussions between PUD and the company to develop this um, along with their attorney to develop these uh, policies and practices and we'll continue to work with them um, as we go through um, and it should be in place hopefully by next year. Okay, and then I guess I do have one um, additional question. I noticed just the average prices and certainly not taking into account the recent winter weather event, but the the gas prices seem a little bit higher than some of the other companies, but I know, I'm assuming that might be related to where their location is, the, the customers that they serve, and so forth. Do you have any information on that? I don't have specific information, but, but that, that could be part of it. Um, they are located in a more remote area. There are less options for purchasing gas in the area in which they're located. They do attempt to make a lot of efforts to reduce pricing through uh, buying bulk purchases of gas, but, but I do think that there are less options in the area that they're located. Okay, and, and I noticed that the Attorney General has also referenced the gas transportation costs um, that can be impactful but on this matter, they didn't have any issues with that. But it, it seems like I think the point that they're making is that, you know, just continuing to look at that. And I know, as you've already mentioned, the company's probably limited on where they can procure, procure gas. And then maybe the location also has an impact on the transportation as well. Thank you. Further questions on the 24-hour agenda? Uh, Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss uh, the three telephone or telecommunication orders uh, that are on. We've got uh, five orders, and the way they're listed here, it's the three that are in the middle. Um, and um, just for background, I'm trying to keep up with our total understanding and uh, responsibility of oversight of uh, telecommunication. Um, I understand Mr. Ryan has uh, the first one and Mr. Jeff Klein has the second one. Uh, maybe I'll start with either one of them. Uh, on the third one, which is lingo, 
uh, it seems that frequently we have um, telecommunication companies that have um, made filings in Oklahoma, but then they decide it'd be better to, to leave or not get started. Uh, and I'm kind of curious as to why that's the case. Uh, so is there anybody can tell me anything in general, why people find it uh, unfavorable to do business in Oklahoma telecommunication? Uh, lingo, I guess, is an example. So Mr. Ryan or Mr. Klein, can you tell us? Uh, well, Mr. Anthony, that's my case. I'll be frank with you. I do not know the answer to your question. I don't know why Lingo specifically decided to leave. Uh, they no longer have any customers in Oklahoma, and they, uh, they simply don't have any business here any longer, so they decided to to uh, uh, give up their CCN. And other than that, I don't know uh, the answer to your question, sir. Okay. Well, it, is my recollection or observation correct that uh, – in the last, say, one or two or three years that there's, um, it, we, we kind of ever so often or frequently have these companies that uh, do uh, what this one is asking. And I think that the commissioners uh, ought to try and keep up with it. And I say that because, um, and, and I can go back to the notebook you all made for me on level three the other day we had, uh, you get a CCN, then you have your service territory. We talked about uh, a horse race and other races. I brought up the track meets, and some people have hurdles to get over, and some people don't have hurdles to get over. But in the um, rule in uh, Chapter 55, it ha does have that the uh, commission uh, shall consider certain factors to determine public interest. Okay, so I think we have a, a responsibility on all, almost all of these all the time to make a public interest consideration. Um, in 19, excuse me, in the year 2015, uh, State Representative John Eccles asked the Attorney General to issue an opinion explaining what telecommunication regulation was in Oklahoma. On the last page of that, it uh, concludes by saying it is therefore the official opinion of the attorney general and it has one, two, and three. And under number one, it has, uh, including some other things, the commission retains the authority to ensure that the marketplace remains competitive. In number three, it says, and to ensure the market remains competitive, the commission may consider various factors such as, and then it goes on to list a few things, including service territory. So today we have uh, this first case on teleport is got the words uh, exchange service territory. Uh, Easy tell has the words uh, uh, additional areas. And now on lingo, um, I'm just trying to understand what's going on with telecommunication regulation because there is acute interest at the federal level. Those of us that attended the recent NARUC meeting know that uh, broadband nationwide is a critical concern. We've got the governor and the legislature's uh, council that's meeting. I've had inquiries uh, from uh, at least uh, one or more people associated with that uh, and so I'm just learning by example, and my example is to take the three items that are on the agenda today. So, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, I would say that a, a responsibility of lingo, if they have done what they ha have obviously done, uh, they've made a, a first step to try to do business in Oklahoma. Uh, they legally have a requirement under our rules and statutes and so forth to have an annual report. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. I mean, yes, okay. Commissioner. That's fine. Okay. They also have uh, this uh, responsibility or obligation to pay. This is a monetary 
thing to pay a utility assessment fee. So if they don't want to do business in Oklahoma anymore, if they withdraw and get this cause uh, order approved today, uh, then they can quit paying the utility assessment fee. But every year on the utility assessment fee, you might have to help me with the language. It, don't they have to fill out a questionnaire or is it a data request? Uh, I think there's a form that they fill out and they uh, they submit with any fees that they owe. They tell us how many customers they have, uh, et cetera. Okay, so the answer is yes. They have that, what you might say, regulatory burden. And at least yes. this company and others, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, I think that uh, Oklahoma has a pretty burdensome uh, system and some people are folding their tent and leaving. Uh, and we're supposed to promote competition. You can only have competition if you have competitors. That means people who will come and invest and uh, maybe bring new technology and new offerings or choice to con customers. Okay, enough on lingo unless anybody else wants to say something. On these other two, um, we're talking about additional territory uh, or expanded territory. Uh, and there's the same uh, chapter 5517-3 that we've talked about recently and in Title 17, Section 131, we have the conven Certificate of Convenience and Necessity. All right, Mr. Klein, are you there? Mr. Klein, if you're there, I'd let you give just a brief introduction of what is before us in the recommendation of this proposed order on easy uh, telephone service. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. And in cause number PUD 2020-102, this is easy telephone company, uh, easy telephone services company, DBA Easy Wireless's request to essentially expand their ETC designation throughout the state of Oklahoma. Uh, ET Easy Wireless already has ETC de designation in certain portions of the state. They have requested to expand that service territory. Uh, no, no parties intervened in this cause. PUD reviewed it and recommends the additional areas. Um, it, this is different than a CCN. Uh, it's, not, it's similar to a service territory expansion in a CCN case, but it's also different. Uh, ETC is handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And in this case, the company requested these additional areas. Uh, there was a public interest analysis that was conducted by PUD. And like I said, PUD did recommend the additional areas to be added to their service territory. Um, with regards to, in fact, I might be able to chime in on the, the 107 case about lingo. With regards to lingo, the company, for whatever reason, decided to stop doing business in Oklahoma. Uh, that's part of competition, adding new, adding new companies to the state, leaving co having companies leave. Uh, the company complied with all the requirements for the cessation of business. We've never really asked why the company decided to leave. Uh, that could be something we could look into in the future. But a lot of them, really, they just say it's not part of their business plan anymore. They've decided that it's not worth being here for whatever reason. I don't believe that our, our requirements are burdensome. Uh, it's submitting an annual report. And if there are no customers or regulated um, regulated customers in the state of Oklahoma, then the company wouldn't be having to actually pay into like the fee, the PUD fee assessment. They also wouldn't have be having to contribute to the OUSF fee assessment either. So if there are no customers, there's really not that burdensome process here for staying in Oklahoma other than submitting that annual report and the P, the annual PUD fee assessment report. Well, there's different ways to look at government regulation, and uh, but I appreciate uh, your, uh, you've mentioned ETC. We also have a CCN, and for uh, easy telephone, back to them, uh, if they want to uh, serve in additional areas or additional uh, service territory, is that a separate proceeding yet to occur? 
No, uh, this is all handled in one proceeding where Easy Wireless already has an ETC, but essentially they already have an ETC with a defined service territory. In this cause, they're essentially requesting an ETC designation again, but in di other areas of the state. So it's very similar to a service territory expansion case, but it's also similar to a, an initial ETC designation case as okay. well. Will, will they, under this order, in this application, be able to serve customers in, I want to use the correct word here, in new service territory or expanded service territory? Yes, the company will be able to, uh, to obtain lifeline benefits for their subscribers located in multiple other areas of the state, nearly statewide. Uh, previously, they were defined that while Easy Wireless could certainly provide service to any customer anywhere in the state, they would only be able to obtain that lifeline subsidy benefit, the nine and a quarter or 34 and a quarter for customers within their designated service territory. So now they can do it nearly statewide. Well, glory, hallelujah. We've got a company that wants to invest and do business and have new customers and the Corporation Commission is saying, uh, let's allow them to do it. Is that right? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, All right. I, you, I feel you, good. I don't, I don't feel good that if we're making uh, too many hurdles and uh, discouraging some of them or saying, uh, tell us some details of your business plan because we need to know that, uh, I think dealing with customers and business is something that changes every day. All right, thank you very much. I think this uh, gives me some comfort that we're asking about what's in the public interest, that we're doing what the Attorney General said in this uh, opinion that we're supposed to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll support all three of these. Right. Any further questions? On um, Commissioner Hyatt, I have some questions on the emergency application of Oklahoma Natural Gas Company. I noticed that uh, Dylan Curran is signed up, and I don't know if Mr. Long was down in the 8.30 meeting that I understand may have recessed for the signing agenda. So, Mr. Curran, I know you're registered. I don't know if Mr. Long also was registered or not, but are you, Mr. Curran, are you or Mr. Long available? I saw both of them exit about five minutes ago, but I, I and I, then I never saw them rejoin. So they're both gone. Okay. Um, I really just had a question that I can I can pose to them later, but I, I got information today that was indicative that producers, gas producers, were told by gatherers and processors to reduce production at different curtailment amounts or face major penalties, and I don't know if that was due to um, a lack of electricity to run the processing facilities, or there was something with compressors, with the gatherers, but that statement and the information provided to me caused me concern, and I just wanted to see if there was any information that Oklahoma Natural Gas um, might have had with regard to that, if that might have been impactful on on their end. I know they're not a gatherer, and I don't think they're a processor, but I just wanted to know if they were aware of any of that. And I can just hold that question and, and bring that up at another time, but I was just made aware of the information today, so I wanted to ask about it. Other than that, I support the, uh, the protective order that's been requested. Thank you. I may not have heard you correctly. Did you say who was... Uh, saying not to do those things? Was it our staff or some? Uh, no, the information I was that was sent to me said that some Oklahoma gas producers were advised by gatherers, gathering companies, and gas processing facilities to reduce produ production and hit these curtailment letters, uh, curtailment rates, 
percentages that varied anywhere from 25 to 65 percent or face major penalties. So I'm assuming it had some type of contractual issues, but the part I was trying to see is if the reason they were told to reduce production was due to lack of electricity to run gas processing facilities or something related to um, the gathering system because I had other information from some gas producers that they shut their wells in totally due to the weather, that it what didn't have anything to do with curtailments. It's like they could not operate their facilities at those type of temperatures. And I think it depended on who the company was and what weatherization probably they, they had in place. So I was just trying to see if I could gather some information. Thank All you. Right. Thank All you. right. I, I, I'd ask Nicole to call them and get them back on the line, and they've just joined. So uh, Mr. Mr. Curran, uh, or I think Commissioner Murphy probably needs to restate her question, or did you hear it, Mr. Curran? Uh, no, Commissioner, I, I just joined and, and okay. uh, I missed her question. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Curran, thank you so much for getting back on. And you might not have any information um, related to this, but I was provided some information or sent some information today that said some natural gas producers, like operators in Oklahoma, were told by gathering facilities and gas processing facilities to reduce or curtail production or face major penalties. And I was, I know that Oklahoma Natural is not a processor and they're not really a gatherer, but I just wondered if this also could have had some impact on, on the situation with natural gas that, that Oklahoma Natural was trying to procure. And I was just wondering if you had any knowledge or if Oklahoma Natural had any knowledge or information of that, because that could have contributed to part of this problem. And I didn't know if that meant the processing facility or the gathering system needed electricity, which they didn't have, so therefore they needed to cut back on the gas that came into their system. And I just wondered if you had any information or Oklahoma Natural had any information on that. Commissioner, uh, thank you for your question, and, uh, and unfortunately, I, I don't have the answers uh, to that question. Uh, I know that there was obviously a constriction in, in supply. I don't uh, know all of the reasons for those constrictions, uh, and there, uh, I, would, I would expect that uh, there may be some knowledge within the company uh, of the circumstances that you're saying, but as you said, as we're, as we're not involved in, in the production or we're not involved in transportation, um, I don't know that we would have any direct knowledge, and, and I unfortunately can't supply that today. Okay. I appreciate you just being available because I would just have concern if there was gas producers in Oklahoma were told to curtail production and it didn't relate to electricity or relate to something else, that that would have had an impact. Um, on this domino was pushed over and saw all these dominoes start falling, at least one portion of it. So uh, I will try to see if I can gather more information, but uh, that was provided to me today and it, it caused me to want to ask questions and, and o Oklahoma Naturals uh, protective order was on and it's, I read through both the emergency application and what's been requested and that's what caused me to want to inquire if there was any knowledge about that particular situation that would have had an impact on Oklahoma Natural. And you've said you don't know, but I appreciate you being available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I might follow up and thank you for being available. Um, I believe that other uh, major public utilities in Oklahoma have filed similar applications. For example, OG&E and PSO uh, regarding the winter storm extraordinary costs. Uh, is that something that you're aware of also? I have some general awareness. Uh, yes, Commissioner Anthony, that those filings have been made. Uh, okay. I can say personally that uh, we represent uh, Arkansas Oklahoma Gas Company, and and uh, on their behalf, uh, we have filed a similar application as well, which is uh, not quite. Uh, it wasn't. It was not filed uh, as quickly as Oklahoma Natural's application. Well, among the ones that I'm following, it looks like you all got the head start, or were first uh, 
to uh, make an application. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm just telling you that I'm trying to keep up with all of this. Um, it, it, the one on PSO I was trying to read through quickly this morning, and it made reference to the two hearings, I'll call them emergency hearings and the emergency orders that were uh, issued, I guess, um, on a Monday and a Tuesday. Um, and, um, and and they were quoting from the orders and from findings in the orders. Um, can you help me out? I'm looking at the order this morning on the protective order, but uh, does your application or does your case uh, also already make reference to those uh, proceedings or those orders, or do you plan to? Uh, well, I have not read PSO's filings, uh, Commissioner, so I'm not uh, precisely sure which orders their filing is, is referring to. Uh, well, were those well, orders I need to be, I'm, I'm talking about the ones on, if I get the dates right, uh, February 15 and February 16. And those were the ones, the first one we had a, uh, or one of them we had a, uh, went into the evening, reconvened at seven o'clock and we issued an order and we had issued one the day before as well. Those are the orders I'm talking about. Uh, well, yes. So we, we presently, Oklahoma National does have a motion uh, to establish the regulatory asset, which is actually uh, before Commissioner, or pardon me, before uh, Administrative Law Judge Murr uh, this morning, and and our motion does reference uh, your orders of the 15th, um, which would have been Commission Order 716932 in cause in in this, in this cause, or pardon me, in cause number 2021-2038. Uh, is that the, the order which PSO is referring to? Yes. They, yes, they and refer well to as, they refer to both of them. I believe so. And so my question is, um, it, 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 and I'm really slow at this, I apologize. The, the order on our signing agenda this morning that we're discussing right now, isn't it related to the same cause that you were talking about before the uh, administrative law judge? So the, the order before you uh, this morning uh, is for the is merely for the protective order in this in the cause which seeks to establish the regulatory asset and our motion to establish the regulatory asset is before ALJ uh, Murr this morning. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Say, I'd like to just say to uh, your company and to PSO and to OG&E, and you mentioned uh, AOG also, uh, any of them that are gonna pursue this matter, and there's obviously quite a few, and they're making reference to those other proceedings, if they want me as a commissioner to do my homework, uh, it would be most helpful if we had a transcript of those two hearings. Now, I know there were emergencies that were done on the telephone, and so maybe we don't have um, as much process and documentation, but obviously uh, they're, they're being uh, referred to. They're a part of the overall case, you might call it, of the winter storm, and uh, it would help me if um, those uh, transcripts uh, become available and quite frankly sometimes the uh, uh, companies uh, can get that done more expeditiously than I can. I'm I making note of that for... uh, Commissioner Anthony and, and we will uh, we will supply those at, at the appropriate time then. Uh, if you decide to do so. Thank you Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you Mr. Curran. Further questions on the 24-hour agenda? Seeing none, Becky, would you please call the roll on the 24-hour agenda? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? I vote aye. Commissioner Murphy? 
Aye. We'll move to agenda item number four, and it will be the extension of uh, 2020 uh, 00001 application of Mr. Rhodes. Uh, it's the seventh extension to our uh, COVID-19 um, procedural plans, and uh, we'll extend it to April 30th. Anything further on that, Mr. Rhodes? Uh, Commissioner, I stand prepared to respond to any concerns or questions. Questions of Mr. Rhodes? Sick. I think it'd be helpful if you just mentioned a few of the statistics that uh, you've told us about when we've met uh, previously on this matter. Uh, in particular, and I don't mean to be anything except uh, have a certain sense of reverence, uh, uh, how many of our staff members have died due to the virus? How many have uh, uh, been on quarantine? How many have been in some of those uh, parameters that you have uh, brought forth before? Uh, yes, Commissioner, very, very quickly. Um, since the emergency began uh, last year, the agency has experienced uh, 55 individuals that have tested positive. Uh, we've had to quarantine employees uh, approximately 243 times during the same time period uh, for both the positive folks and then others who may have been um, exposed. Um, it, we're, we've experienced, I think, in our agency the same kind of curve that, that uh, the state and the nation have experienced. Um, in November, December, and January, our, our agency case numbers were up 73 percent. 73 percent of our total occurred in uh, November, December, and January. So uh, fortunately, those have dropped off for, for February. We've only had one uh, case reported. So very pleased about that. Um, However, I, you know, 70 percent of our personnel have not become eligible under the current phase uh, vaccination plan to receive those vaccinations, so we're not out of the woods yet. Um, I would also add that on January 1, the state of Oklahoma had approximately 290,000 total cases. On February 24th, uh, there were 421,000 reported positive cases, so that's an increase of 44 percent in just that short uh, time frame, even though uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that the current downtrend continues. So I hope that's responsive uh, to that question. Thank you. All right. Further questions? Seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, Peggy, would you please call the roll on 20-1? Mr. Hyatt? Aye. Mr. Anthony? Vote aye. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Will there be any new business to come before the meeting? Seeing no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. to terminate.